My name is Juliana, and like Hattie said, I'm a formerly opioid-dependent person. I'm formerly incarcerated, um, and I've been working in Ibogaine since 2012. I also just want to make it clear that I don't use the term addict um, because of the stigma, the stigma that comes with it. I don't use the term recovery because that term signifies that people who struggle with drugs are sicker than other people, and I don't agree with that. And I try to stay away from the word addiction as well, just because of the massive misconceptions that come along with this term. I'll be using the term substance use issues um, for this presentation and in all of my work. Um, I work in harm reduction in New York City, and so I'm coming from that perspective. Um, and I'm trained under Andrew Tatarsky's Integrative Harm Reduction Psychotherapy, which is the lens that I do my work in Ibogaine. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about what is happening with the Ibogaine treatment community currently? Um, so even though I'm going to be talking about the Ibogaine treatment community, and there's going to be people after me really focusing on Gabon and reciprocity and uh, those efforts, I just want to talk about this issue because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for um, the indigenous people of Gabon who practice Buiti, and it's really important that we acknowledge um, this community and how important it is uh, that we give back. Um, so. I've seen a lot of patterns of what I like to call modern day colonization. Um, there's a lot of white people profiting off of indigenous medicine, not in, just in Iboga, but in all of psychedelic medicine. Um, there are many practitioners working in Ibogaine uh, who are using unsustainably sourced medicine. Um, many do not give back to communities in Gabon, although that's been improving. I just want to shout out to my friends at Root Healing who do a lot of work um, to give back to Gabon and developing the relationship with communities there. And there's other places too as well doing this, so that's really exciting. Um, uh, mostly, like I said, it's mostly right pra practitioners that are profiting off of clinical Ibogaine treatment currently. Um, there's a lack, overall lack of communication and collaboration between traditional BT practitioners and Ibogaine clinics. In my opinion, we should have an indigenous council that we consult for all of our decisions. Um, and there's many practitioners who are reluctant to use Boa Conga source Ibogaine, which is the sustainable source of Ibogaine. Um, and this is just, I was speaking with a group in Gabon, a, a pygmy group. This is the Association for the Development of the Culture of Pygmy Peoples of Cab Gabon. And they wanted to uh, express this sentiment to the audience here. Um, and that says, foreign associations traffic and trade are Iboga without respect for customary uses or blessings, or even come to appropriate the knowledge of this plant from the pygmies without a memorandum or understanding of its use. There is never an equitable sharing of income from the sale at dubious prices of Ariboga acquired at will, and this is never made transparent to the donor peoples. We recommend to the international community and donors who are interested in this work of Ariboga to address directly associations led by men, women, young girls and boys, indigenous pygmies, who are recognized, authorized and blessed to practice traditional cultural exchanges. And so I feel this is really important to express because there are a lot of foreign interests in Gabon right now, and not all of them are paying to respect to all communities. Um, so these are the parents of Western Ibogaine treatment. Some of you here know about Howard and Norma Lotsoff. Howard accidentally discovered the powers of Ibogaine in the early 1960s when it got him off of heroin overnight. And he spent his whole life developing Ibogaine as a treatment along with his wife, Norma. Um, I, we need to acknowledge this because none of us would be here talking about this if it wasn't for Howard and Norma. And I'm gonna talk a little more about Norma at the end of this presentation. Um, so this is just some of the people, the history of the Ibogaine treatment community. Um, Howard trained a number of people in the Amsterdam treatment days and in the U.S. as well. Um, there, this isn't everybody, of course, but these are some of the original players in the late 90s and early 2000s who trained many of the providers working today. So these are kind of like our uh, treatment ancestors, you could say. Um, we have Claire Wilkins, who was mentioned in the previous presentation, Hattie here as well, uh, Paul Featherstone, Sarah Glott, Rocky and Asha and Richie. Um, there's, like I said, countless people have been trained uh, by these individuals. Because there's no standardized training 
protocol, which is uh, a big problem. Uh, becoming trained as an Ibogaine provider is kind of a DIY experience. You have to find somebody who's willing to train you. There's no set length of time. There's no test or certification. So you just have to hope that you find somebody good who's going to give you the right training. And unfortunately, often people are not getting the right training, although these folks have done some good work overall. Um, so where are the popular clinic locations? Mexico, of course, has the most clinics per capita. Um, but Costa Rica, Brazil, uh, who has a robust body of research happening, also has a plethora of clinics, South Africa, uh, Portugal, and there's uh, other countries as well. Greece has a clinic. Um, so there's somebody in Serbia working. There's some clinics in Colombia currently as well. And in the U.S. and Europe, there's traveling and underground providers. Um, there's different treatment styles uh, that are popular among different regions. Um, in Mexico, it tends to be the medical detox approach. Um, then, of course, there's the underground hotel treatments, which used to be happening more often in the US and I know happen in Europe as well. There's uh, traditional Guizhi treatment. There's more of these holistic retreat styles that integrate some of the medical detox approaches. And some offer a combination of all of these. I trained in one clinic where we were very medical, but we also had some version of Buiti happening as well. So there's a lot of crossing over of these different styles. Um, who goes to which countries? So US citizens typically go to Mexico, uh, Costa Rica, and more recently, Portugal. Brazilians stay in Brazil because they have a number of clinics operating there. Um, Europeans access the underground treatments or they go to Portugal, Spain, and Greece, and South Africans tend to stay there because they have a number of clinics running there. Who accesses treatment? Um, U.S. citizens seeking treatment, from what I've seen and who I work with, are typically male, white, and privileged. This is a massive problem that we're taking an indigenous African medicine and we're giving it to heal only the most privileged demographic. So what are we going to do to change this so that we have women, um, people of color, people who really need access to this? I can tell you 85% um, of the people who contact me for Ibogaine integration support are white men with money. Um, and I'm happy to help them, but I would really like to help people who are more harmed by the capitalist society that we live in. Um, so this is some of the issues that we have, some of the unpleasant themes that we have in Ibogaine treatment. We have no governing body or way to ensure safe protocols are followed. We have clinical protocols, but they are not enforced by anybody. Um, there's no supervision or training process for practitioners, which I mentioned before. Um, there's minimal protection for Iboga itself or the traditional Buisi communities who use it, although that is improving somewhat. Um, there's a lack of support available for those who have had negative treatment experiences. Um, and this is also improving. GIDA, the Global Ibogaine Therapy Alliance, um, has brought back our uh, peer advocacy support group. And so we're going to be, and we already are supporting people who have complaints about treatments and clinics. So you can look soon. There's going to be um, an email address and a website up for that so that if you have a bad experience or someone you know, you can send them our way. Um, there's also minimal support for the practitioners themselves if they're struggling, and I'll be diving into that in a little bit. Um, so my story which is a lesson in the importance of safety protocol. Um, so that's me in a hospital after my Ibogaine treatment. And the way that I got there was I was an opioid user for seven years. I ended up um, on fentanyl, not street fentanyl, but actual pharmaceutical fentanyl. And I went to do Ibogaine treatment directly from fentanyl, which is not recommended. You don't, you, Although fentanyl is short acting, it tends to stick around in your system for a longer time. And so you need to be switched to a short acting opioid before doing Ibogaine. This did not happen. I went to what I thought was a safe clinic in Guatemala. And as soon as I arrived, they started administering Ibogaine without any time doing stabilization. That what happened to me was completely avoidable if you had followed the clinical safety protocols, but this unfortunately didn't happen. Um, they, the guy who was dosing me was not measuring the doses. He had decided to dose intuitively. So I ended up getting the equivalent of 40 milligrams per kilo. And for those of you that know, that's about double the amount. <laughs> yeah, there was making a face. It's about double the amount that you should ever give anybody. Um, his reasoning was that my withdrawals weren't going away, which was true because I had such a high tolerance. Um, so he kept giving me medicine. 
What ended up happening is uh, I went into a prolonged QT and a arrhythmia called torsade disc points, which if left untreated ends in cardiac arrest. And I ended up having six cardiac arrests and being put on an external pacemaker for about 10 days in an ICU in Guatemala City. After that 10 days, I got taken off the pacemaker and everything's fine. I have no residual damage. Um, but obviously, it was very scary uh, for my family and for the providers as well. And it, I narrowly survived that treatment. In fact, we had been turned away from three hospitals. And by the time we got to the fourth is when I collapsed in the first cardiac arrest. So it was a very near miss that we arrived to the fourth hospital just in time. And like I said, this was completely avoidable if they had done the proper screening, the proper stabilization time, and they had actually measured their doses. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, and so this is why I'm so focused on safety and ethical issues in the community, because I got my introduction to this medicine in this way. Regardless of that, when I woke up in the hospital, I felt like I was given a completely new life and that a huge weight had been lifted off of me. And my mom tells me I kept saying repeatedly over the phone, I'm not in withdrawal. I'm not in withdrawal. I couldn't believe it. It was after waking up in withdrawal countless times throughout my life, it was unbelievable that I wasn't sick. I almost didn't care what had happened to me because I felt so good. So it worked, and that's why I'm still here working in Ibogaine. I didn't get scared away by this, surprisingly. This just made me want to make it better, and so that's why I'm doing the work that I do now. Um, there's some articles on the side that I've been featured in with, with my story. Um, and so I'm not going to, this isn't a safety presentation, but I wanted to put this up here to talk a little bit about safety. This is the Gita's Ibogaine guidelines for Ibogaine assisted detoxification, which are in need of an upgrade, and that's somewhat in the work. Um, so there's a number of exclusion criteria for Ibogaine. Um, almost all cardiac issues, seizure history, um, certain psychiatric conditions, um, impaired liver function, the most essential thing with Ibogaine is the EKG. You need to do one to be eligible. You need to do one when you arrive. You need to do one after the first dose. You need to keep doing them. This is not negotiable. And somehow I'm still, still hearing of places that aren't repeatedly doing EKGs or they're accepting people for treatment with no EKG and they have them fly down and they don't give them the EKG till they get there. This is really unethical and unsafe. Um, a liver panel to make sure the liver's functioning is necessary. Um, there's the full disclosure of a detailed medical history is crucial. Um, so other serious risks and a number of deaths are associated with combining alcohol and benzodiazepine withdrawal with Ibogaine. Benzos are like Valium or Xanax. You cannot detox off of them with Ibogaine. It's incredibly dangerous. If you combine benzo withdrawal, which is already QT prolonging, with Ibogaine, it's almost guaranteed fatality. And I've seen it in real time. Somebody nearly died because they didn't tell us that they were coming off of a benzo. They hid it from us until the last minute. Um, and so anybody coming in with benzos, I would say either you stabilize them through the treatment or you tell them to do a year-long slow taper with the Ashton manual before you even attempt to give someone Ibogaine. Um, not people not stabilized properly before treatment. Um, without hydration, electrolytes, um, fentanyl not out of system. This is a big deal because in the U.S., everybody's coming to Mexico now with fentanyl in their system. And so this is prolonging the course of Ibogaine treatment significantly. Um, it takes anywhere from 7 to 14 days for people to piss clean from fentanyl. And if you rush that and you, you're on a schedule and you need to get in the next treatment and you start giving someone Ibogaine with fentanyl in their system, it's very dangerous. Um, but if you wait, the treatment cost is going to go up. So providers right now are in a really tricky position of having to keep people often for 21 days, which triples the cost of treatment, um, or rush them through when it's not safe. Um, so this is a really sticky situation, and I'm really hoping that fentanyl doesn't end up here in Europe and start complicating things for providers here. Um, common treatment mistakes. I've already talked about this a little bit. Um, not drug testing for benzodiazepines before. So this is the mistake I made the second clinic I trained at. Um, we had drug tests that tested for everything but not benzos. And so the person that came and did not tell us they had been regularly taking Xanax unexpectedly went into benzo withdrawal on Ibogaine and had three cardiac arrests. She luckily survived. But if your drug tests don't have benzos on them, you're missing the most important thing. 
Um, and this is a mistake that has been made, is still made by practitioners today that I hear about on a semi-regular basis. Um, Re again, benzodiazepines, reducing them before or during treatment is a no-no. There's a very popular clinic in central Mexico who two years ago decided to rapidly taper, taper someone off their benzos before Ibogaine. They ended up in the hospital. This is something, this is Ibogaine 101. You don't combine a reduction of benzos with Ibogaine. Um, again, not waiting for a clear fentanyl test. I mentioned that. Treating a high-risk client because you need the money. Uh, a new clinic in Cancun rushed a high-risk client down for treatment and they died because they were too high risk. You don't put pressure on someone to come down because you need the business. And this is why I question the model of for-profit clinics. I think a community model, like a cooperative model would be better because then you're not giving the treatments for the profit. You're doing it for the benefit of the people and for the safety of the people that you're treating. Um, Pushing sensationalizing views of treatment outcomes, using the words cure a solution. We can't be telling people that we're curing anything. There's no overnight cure. It's a lifelong process of healing. And when you tell someone something like 10 years of therapy in one night, you're setting up a really unrealistic expectation and you're setting people up to be disappointed. I've heard people say, I begin didn't work for me like I heard about, so nothing's going to work for me. So I'm not going to try anymore. I give up. Or people go home and commit suicide over this because Ibogaine didn't work like magic, like they were told. We need to get rid of this word cure. We need to get rid of the word solution because they're completely unrealistic. And this goes for all psychedelics as well. Ibogaine is an amazing door opener, but the hardest work comes afterwards. And by sensationalizing this medicine, we're not fully preparing people and it's not ethical. And we're, we're not actually getting their consent for the treatment if they don't fully understand what they're getting themselves into. Um, and another big mistake, not doing an EKG after the test dose. This is crucial. You never know how someone's gonna respond to this medicine. I have friends who were treating someone that weren't even detoxing off of a substance who, was, who were given 200 milligrams of Ibogaine and their QT prolonged incredibly. And they realized this person cannot handle a flood dose. There's no way. And they had to low dose them. They would have not known this had they not done an EKG off of after the test dose. And this is why this is so important. Um, not stabilizing people for enough time after arrival with EKGs administered daily. Um, not allowing time for flexibility with each treatment. You can't really standardize Ibogaine in a seven day process. You dose on this day and then you wait on this day. Everybody reacts so differently, there has to be room for flexibility. And just because you have another client coming or you have a schedule is not a reason to rush somebody through treatment. It's incredibly unsafe to push a particular agenda when everyone reacts so differently to this medicine. Um, not waiting long enough after buprenorphine or methadone. This is another issue. It's pretty standard knowledge that to do a flood dose, I'm not talking about low dose because that's a different protocol, but for flood doses, you after methadone, you have to wait a, wait a minimum of four weeks. If you don't, that person's going to be severely sick and uncomfortable after their treatment. I've seen it happen. For buprenorphine, it should be six weeks. The withdrawal from buprenorphine, and I've lived through it, is incredibly long. Sometimes people are still experiencing acute symptoms three months later. And so if you don't wait the six weeks after boop and you give them Ibogaine, like some clinics are doing after seven days, you're going to send home somebody sick and their chances of success are very, very low. Um, I know this is tricky because the switching to morphine or a short acting opioid for that length of time isn't doable, especially in the U.S. Uh, but there's no point in doing Ibogaine if you're going to go home being in incredible pain and withdrawal, not being able to sleep. So what are we doing right now that I've talked about all the mistakes that we're making and things that can go wrong? Um, Claire Wilkins, which was talked about in the previous presentation, developed the safer low dose protocol that's used by many providers. Um, she was the third person I trained with and who I saw the most successful clients with in all of my training. Um, we're finally moving away from the disease model and abstinence only model. Um, viewing substance use issues as a brain disease doesn't make sense. And this concept was invented by a charlatan. It's been scientifically disproven. Um, we need to be approaching people
from a trauma-informed perspective, not from a stigmatizing, categorizing, othering perspective. I don't view myself as having a disease. I think every single person on this planet suffers with a destructive behavior at some point in their lives. It's not just people who use substances problematically that have this. We all have this at some point. It just so happens that drugs are criminalized and we make them unsafe by criminalizing them. Drugs, safe, drugs could be safe. We could make this safe and it wouldn't be so problematic. Um, in, we've increased continuing care. So Inscape Recovery in Central Mexico and Third Eye Doula in um, the Baja area doing post ibogaine care, they're doing phenomenal work. And as many of you probably know, just a week or two of ibogaine treatment isn't enough for people. And often people are sent home uh, to unhealthy environments and it's really hard to do well when you're living with abusive uh, family members or in unsafe conditions. And so these aftercare spots are really crucial and I hope that we see more of them. Um, we have more widespread understanding of cardiac risk, although we still have a ways to go. Um, Ibogaine for Parkinson's and other neurological conditions is, is blossoming and it's really exciting to see research in the near future on that. We do have increasing reciprocity with Gabon, like I said. Um, improvement in pre and post support and we are gradually improving support amongst those working in the industry. But I do want to talk about this. So provider health. We've got a big problem with people who work in Ibogaine and not taking good care of themselves. Um, on average, we have one provider a year who dies or ends up hospitalized. On the, on the left here are two providers who died because they didn't take care of themselves properly. Working in Ibogaine is the most stressful job that you can do. And many of us are coming from years of substance use issues and went directly into providing Ibogaine without doing the proper work on ourselves. And so people are in a really dangerous position when they're coming with a lot of trauma and they're working around the clock with traumatized people um, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, there's a lack of structure and funding to support providers. There's no fund set aside to support people who are struggling. Uh, stigma and shame. There's a culture of shame, secrecy, and stigma in the community, resulting in a fear of asking for help and a lack of accountability. Um, this is my, my former partner on a project, Shay Pruger. She's not passed away, but she's in a very bad condition right now, using substances and experiencing homelessness. And this is something that could have been avoided if we had better community support and less stigma. Um, and this, I mean, this isn't unique. This happens every year in Ibogaine treatment, uh, which is heartbreaking. Um, ethical issues, pushing people to come for treatment before they have a stabilized living situation. This is a big issue. If you know somebody isn't returning to a supportive and healing environment, then they're not ready to do Ibogaine. It's not gonna work for them. Um, lying to clients when the family asks, asks you to. I've actually seen this happen to one of my clients. It's completely unethical. You always have to be transparent to the people that you're working with. Um, rushing a protocol to fit your next client. I talked about this. There's rampant sexual violations among providers as well, um, which is, goes without saying, is absolutely unacceptable. Um, no informed consent process upon intake. Uh, many people are working without um, documentation, and uh, like reviewing um, what the boundaries are. What about physical touch? Um, and this is something that's really important. I see that somebody is giving a wheel of consent workshop here. Uh, I think that's really excellent. We need more talk, more talk of consent in the psychedelic world. Um, we don't have a process, process to establish uh, handling grievances or a professional to consult with when conflict occurs. I would love to see mediation and transformative justice funded in the Ibogaine and psychedelic world. Um, let's see, I'll go to the next one because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, what should be included in pre and post care? So I work from the IHRP standpoint, um, which focuses on supporting individuals and identifying what works for them and what their goals are. I don't push abstinence. I support people in choosing what works for them, which might be use of substance, substances or re just reducing substance use. That's also a success. Um, it acknowledges the vast uniqueness of everyone's path and what and the and of what their healing journey should look like. This is the only approach that's compatible with psychedelic work. Work. We can't be pushing a particular version of success onto people. Let people decide what their success looks like. Don't tell them what it is. Um, supports clients in building community and social networks. Community is absolutely essential. Um, 
post Ibogaine, this is like the, the biggest medicine, especially for people that have been in isolation for many years. Um, I emphasize this a lot in my work with people. Um, work towards deconstructing internalized narratives of colonization and patriarchy, because it emphasizes that all experiences and ideas have value. So, it, you know, in modern capitalism, there's this notion of good and bad, black and white, right and, want, right and wrong. And I think people get really caught up in this and they want to be perfect. And in my, when I'm working with people, I like, I want people to embrace that everything that they've been through has value and that there's no mistake that, you know, there's, there's people that work in the field who are really prominent and doing great work. And I can still tell that they feel so much shame and guilt for what they've been through with substances. This doesn't need to happen. This is a social construct that we're pushing onto people that because you struggle with drugs, there's something wrong with you or that you're bad. We're just trying to survive this exploitative capitalist system, you know, and sometimes using a substance or leading on another crutch is the only way that we can survive. The point of Ibogaine is not to become more productive or better at capitalism. It's to help people to be happy, to be content, and to actually enjoy life. It's not about being good in your career or being productive and making money. What about helping people just to feel good and have enjoyment without substances, without their coping mechanism? Um, the state of mainstream drug treatment and how it influences Ibogaine treatment. Um, mainstream substance use philosophies operate on dehumanizing and stigmatizing concepts that label people as disease and unable to think for themselves. The one-size-fits-all approach of the 12-step program and its basis in capitalism and hyper-individualism. We can't, a lack of emphasis on the sick societal structures that are at the root of all mental health issues. The root of people's suffering is the exploitative nature of the society we live in. It's not an individual problem coming from them. Yes, there are um, neurochemical issues in the brain, but really what people are trying to do is just, like I said, survive in the system. Um, a society based on colonization, patriarchy, and white supremacy with a mental health treatment system based on these same violent structures. We can't carry these oppressive symptoms systems into Ibogaine treatment. Working with Ibogaine is only compatible with an open approach that doesn't, that doesn't push a particular agenda, but embraces people's own definitions of what happiness and success looks like for them. Unfortunately, there are still clinics that are pushing these old school narratives about so-called addiction um, and what healing should look like afterwards. Finding a safe treatment facility. This is a guide that I came up with um, in conjunction with some colleagues in the field. This is just a couple of the examples of the questions to ask when you're finding a clinic. This is on my website. I'm happy to share this with anybody or post it anywhere. Um, I think there's about 20 questions on there that will mostly weed out safe practitioners. There's no guarantee, obviously. Um, it's really important that people use their intuition when you're calling a clinic and asking them questions. This is a guide I came up with fire, with Fireside Project in the US um, that is a 24-hour psychedelic emergency hotline. Um, Joshua White and I made a list of questions and um, red flags when you're calling a provider. This is an Ibogaine specific. This is more for other psychedelics, so the safety isn't there. Um, but I just wanted to put it up here because I, um, I'm proud of the guide, and I think it's really helpful for other psychedelics. Um, I just wanted to show this because I think it's hilarious. This is an Ibogain clinic. I'm not going to say who. The most exclusive healing center in the world offering the most powerful healing system. Red flags, okay? If anybody is offering this sensationalized stuff, um, obviously run the, un the other way. This is, this is like scrupulous marketing, and unfortunately, I see stuff. Best Ibogain clinic in the world. We've treated 10,000 people. Please uh, take note of that and choose somebody that is more interested in helping you to find the center that works for you rather than pushing their own products onto you. Um, what we need going forward, we need standardized safety training, trauma-informed mental health training, scholarship funds, minimum 50% staff, um, more contributions to Gabon and Boothi practitioners, um, mediation accountability process, and licensed supervision of all clinic staff. I really would love to see this happen in my lifetime, that everybody has someone to consult with. Um, and one last thing, sorry, Haiti, this is really important. Norma Lotsoff, 
the wife of Howard Lotsoff. Howard and Norma are responsible for all of us being here at all. And right now, she is experiencing a really serious health crisis. Um, she doesn't have anyone to help her. She needs to move out of her house urgently. She also needs at-home care, um, is barely able to walk right now. I just saw her last week. And so uh, we have a GoFundMe um, for her right now. I'm, the link is in my Instagram. Um, and I'm happy to, sh if you want to just come up to me, I can share with you the link. But it's really important that we take care of Norma because this is our mother. This is, the, this is why Western Ibogaine treatment is happening at all. So I hope um, if you can, if you'll all be able to contribute to this fund so that um, she can be taken care of like she should be. Thanks.